I love that song. It fits so perfectly with uh, a series that says, I'll build my life upon this, this firm foundation. And that concept is taken straight from the Sermon on the Mount. Um, and in this series, we've been talking through Matthew chapter 5, the first part of the Sermon on the Mount. But Jesus' conclusion is this parable where he, t- where he talks about two builders, right? The wise builder and the foolish builder. And the wise builder builds his house on the rock. And because he builds his house on the rock, when the storms come, his house still stands. And it's supposed to be an analogy, a metaphor, for building your life upon Jesus' teaching. And so we want to be like that wise builder, build our life on this firm foundation that is what Jesus teaches us in the Sermon on the Mount. So with that in mind, let me read from Matthew chapter 5. And uh, we're going to see that there's some strangeness about these verses. And hopefully we'll make our way through that strangeness together. So here's what Jesus says in Matthew 5, starting in verse 33. Again, you have heard that it was said to our ancestors, you must not break your oath, but you must keep your oaths to the Lord. But I tell you, don't take an oath at all, either by heaven, because it is God's throne, or by the earth, because it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, because it is the city of the great king. Do not swear by your head, because you cannot make a single hair white or black. But let your yes mean yes, and your no mean no. Anything more than this is from the evil one. Now what I think is strange about these verses, uh, Jesus is talking about this importance of not making oaths and then not keeping them, that we should be people of our word. And that seems like a good teaching, but it it strikes me as strange when you look at what else is here. In previous weeks, Alan's talked about murder and hate. When you hate someone, when you harbor hate in your, in your heart, that's like, like murdering them almost. It's a big deal. Talk about lust, how when you look at someone with lustful intent, it's like committing adultery with them. And divorce and remarriage and how big of a deal that is. Next week we're talking about violence and retaliation. And in the middle of all this, it's like the application is, oh yeah, so, okay, don't murder people, right? don't be hateful, um, don't lust after people, and don't make pinky promises. Wait, why is this here? It struck me as just strange that in Jesus' most famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, right smack dab in the middle of it is, and don't make promises. And I want to talk about why Jesus talks about this here, why this gets here, because I don't want anyone today to just read this on the surface and say, well, I don't make promises, therefore I'm done. Marked off the list, I'm good. I'm obeying Jesus in this area. Because why he talks about this, and the deeper message here, I think, is actually applicable to all of us. So how did this get here? Why is Jesus talking about making promises in the middle of all these crazy things? And the more I reflected on that, I thought, you know what? He's talking about that because our words are so powerful. And our actions and our ability to hurt people or to build them up. So I, I want us to just get this together before we go and dig further into this. And so to help us do that, I have a, a question I want you to share with the person next to you. And if you're not next to anyone, well, you get to move. Um, so... I want to ask you to make yourself a little uncomfortable and share a little bit this morning, and this will help get at why uh, Jesus says what he does. So what I want you to share with the person next to you is just share and tell them something you're good at or skilled at, better than the average person at, okay? What is something you're good at? Ready, set, go. You don't have to whisper, by the way. You can just talk. It's okay. And if the other person hasn't shared, make sure they get a chance to share and answer as well.
All right. As you make your way back to your seat, I want you to consider something. When was the moment you realized that you were good or skilled or better than average at that thing? Just hold that memory in your head when you realize, wow, I might, this might be like a special gift or ability, a special talent that I have that other people don't have. Because I bet what you'll find is words spoken by someone, from someone, naming something, encouraging you in some way. Like for me, when I look back, um, there's a couple of memories that stick out in my mind. I can remember so clearly, even though it was so long ago. I remember so clearly in eighth grade, my English teacher holding me on the shoulder saying, Luke, you're a good writer. You should work on this. And I remember um, my youth pastor asked me to preach a sermon for a, a, youth, a youth Sunday. And so there were like three of us youth that got to preach messages. And then afterwards, um, one of the other moms was talking to my mom. And I overheard them. And this other mom told my mom something like, well, I know what he's going to do when he grows up. <laughs> and I was like, ha, ha, ha. But those planted, those planted seeds in my heart, those words. And I bet for you, too, those words or compliments or encouragements, they have affected the trajectory of your life, why you've done certain things and why you haven't done other things. Now consider for a second, how might your life be different if you could go back in time and that person didn't say anything, didn't compliment you, didn't encourage you, didn't name that. Or worse, what if that person insulted you in this area? How might your whole life be different if someone had simply used different words? My point and what I want us to see is that words are extremely powerful. Words can affect the trajectory of people's lives for good and for bad. Jesus' half-brother James said it like this. He said, he said, so too, though the tongue, what we use to make words, though the tongue is a small part of the body, it boasts great things. And it gives us an, an analogy. Consider how a small fire sets ablaze a large forest, right? It just takes a spark to start a forest fire. And James says, the mouth and our words are like that. Just a tiny word can cause great damage. And he goes on, and the tongue is a fire, the tongue, a world of unrighteousness, is placed among our members, our body parts. It stains the whole body, sets the course of life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. Oh, tell us what you really think about the tongue, James. Right? But what he's getting at is our words are so powerful. We need to be careful with our words because they're so powerful. And Jesus knew the same thing. Where do you think James learned this from? Jesus knows our words are so powerful. Right? Just think what we can say with our words, how we can affect people's lives, right? You can do it. Good job. You'll never. Worthless. Right? Great good and great bad through just our words. And that is why, in the midst of all these other heavy topics, Jesus is focuses on our oaths and our promises, our words, because they're a big deal. And they can cause people great good or great harm. And so the question is, how do we handle our words well then? What does that look like? And so let's look at what Jesus teaches and why he teaches it. So he starts off by saying, Again, you have heard that it was said to our ancestors, you must not break your oath, but you must keep your oaths to the Lord. Now, if you haven't been here for this whole series, um, this may not sound as familiar, but if you have, this sounds very familiar. This is how Jesus starts everything. He says, you've heard that it was said, but I say to you. You have this tradition, you have this law, but I'm giving you a new way. And he's helping us get both beyond the letter of the law, this legalism, and just lawlessness, no law, to something different, a different way of living and approaching others in the world. So right now, he starts off by simply quoting the Old Testament. Leviticus 19.12 basically said, if you make a vow in the name of the Lord, you better keep it because you are involving God's name and that involve God, involves God himself. And think of the Ten Commandments, right? Do not take the name of your Lord in vain. And the idea in the ancient Israelite world was that, that the Israelites were these people who had taken God's name upon themselves. They were God's people 
And so if they made a vow in God's name and then broke it, that would disgrace God himself. Right? That the people were su- supposed to reflect a God that is true in their actions with one another. And so the Old Testament law focused on the oaths you had to keep. Right? All the Old Testament basically says is if you make a promise and tie that to God's name, you have to keep that. Right? God's very holiness is at stake. Right? So the Old Testament law focused on the oaths you had to keep. If you make a vow in the name of the Lord, you have to keep it. Now what's fascinating is that by Jesus' day, they had built up all these additional rules and regulations for promises. So what happened is this. Uh, they took this very seriously, right? If you make a vow in the name of the Lord, you have to keep it. But then they said, well, what if you make a vow in the name of something else? Right? Like If you have to keep 100% of the vows you make in God's name, well, if you make a vow in the name of something else, it shouldn't be 100%. <laughs> See the logic? Right? Maybe if you swear on the temple instead of on God himself, maybe that's like an 80% vow. Like You need to keep that vow like at least 80% of the time. But that's not the same as swearing on God's name, so it's not as big of a deal if you break it. Or if you like swear in the name of your head, right? I swear by my head. Well, you have a lot more control over that, and that's kind of just a weird thing. I mean, that's like maybe a 50% vow. Like you could break that vow like 50% of the time, and it's probably okay. Just don't swear on God's name. You have to keep that 100% of the time. But if you swear on these other things, it's not as big of a deal. And they really have, you can read in the Mishnah, the oral law, this list of regulations they had come up with of, if you swear by this, that's a bigger deal than if you swear by this. And what's so ironic about this is this law that was basically meant to be, say, be people of your word, became a system and regulations on how to be deceptive. <laughs> Here's a bunch of oaths you can break. Right? That's what they had developed. And so Jesus has no patience for this, right? And it's interesting, his reasoning. He says, because whatever you swear on, even if you don't swear on God's name, Anything you swear on involves God in some way. If you swear on the temple, well, that's God's temple, so you're actually involving God's name anyway. Even if you swear on your own head, you're made in the image of God, and the whole earth is God's, and so are you, and so you're actually involving God anyway. So let's just stop with all of this. So Jesus is trying to help us get beyond the letter of the law, right? If you make oaths in God's name, you have to keep it. Jesus wants us to get beyond that. Now, it might be tempting in our day and age to say, okay, well, let's just not worry about our words at all. and Just say whatever you want. No law. But that's not Jesus' conclusion. Look at what he says in verse 37. But let your yes mean yes and your no mean no. Anything more than this comes from the evil one. It's from the evil one. All right, so the Old Testament law focused on the oaths you had to keep. The legalism of Jesus' day focused on the oaths that you could break. So what is Jesus' focus? Jesus' focus is on being the kind of people who do not need oaths at all. He does not say, your words don't matter, don't worry about it. He says, actually, your words matter a great deal. You should seek to live in a way that's consistent with the words you speak. Become the kind of people who have total congruity between what they say and what they do. That when you say yes, you do it. And when you say no, it's because you can't and you don't do it. Say, if you honor Jesus, honor your word. If you want to follow Jesus and obey Jesus in this area, we should seek to be people of our word and who honor our word. So I was thinking about all this this week and what it is in us that wants to make promises and why we do that and have that tendency. And um, so I told you my parents are visiting this week. Um, so they got in late Wednesday night and Anna woke up early Thursday morning all excited that they were there, but she was also nervous. And so she comes up to me and it's like, Dad, I thought you would be gone. I was like, wait, what's going on? And then I remembered that when my parents visit, Janelle and I usually take a trip and get away for a couple of days. So Anna was nervous that 
we would have just like slipped out in the night basically because <laughs> my parents were there. She's like, I thought you'd be gone. I was like, Anna, if, if mom and dad are going to leave, we would tell you. We would tell you before we left. And she looked up at me and said, promise? <laughs> and my first thought was, this is a perfect illustration for my sermon. <laughs> <laughs> no, honestly, my first thought was, what happened? Like, when did, I, when did I break my commitment to you? That me saying, I, will t- I would tell you before I left, isn't quite good enough. That you need something more. A- and what I realized is that when other people want us to make promises or when we feel the need to make promises, that desire to make promises, to make oaths, to firm up our commitments, that comes from the fact that we weakened our words by our actions. That there have been too many times where we've said one thing and done something else. When people look at us and want to promise from us, or when we even feel the need to be like, no, I really will do it, that comes from the fact that we've weakened our words by our actions. And so, um, This is something I need to take seriously. I want to become the kind of person that when I tell my kids, I'll do this, that there's no lingering doubt in their minds. There's no questioning, I don't know, Dad, will you? Jesus has challenged us to become the kind of people who are always consistent with what we say and what we do. So again, in Jesus' day, there was this funky thing going on, right, where people were making these elaborate promises that they could break, and that's not really our struggle in our day and age. We don't have this elaborate system of promises that we feel like we can break, but we still struggle with being people who will consistently do what we say we'll do, being truthful people, and and this is an important point. We don't want to just be honest people. It's more than that, because the truth is you can be an honest jerk, right? You could take this really literally And anytime anyone asks you for anything, just be like, no, I don't want to do that. And you technically would not be breaking your word, I guess, ever. People say, hey, could you help me out with this? And he's like, no. That's not what Jesus is saying. We don't want to just be truthful. We want to be trustworthy people. People who reflect what Jesus was like in the world. And we still struggle with that. We don't get that perfectly all the time. So maybe the exact struggle that this looks like is different for us, but we still want to honor our word. If you honor Jesus, honor your word. And so I want to give you three things where um, this is actually a Luke list. Okay, As I considered, what is it in me that wants to lie? Or maybe not lie, like fudge on the truth just a little bit. Whitewash the truth. You know, we talk about white lies. I'm not talking about the flagrant lies. I think in general, most people know lying's bad, it's hurtful, you shouldn't make these big lies. But what about those little things? Where does that come from? And how can I combat that? And so this is not all the ways we lie to ourselves or to others, uh, but these are just the most convicting ones for me. So um, hopefully this is not just for me. Hopefully this helps you as well. So here are some reasons I tend to give little lies to myself and to others. So number one, we lie to avoid vulnerability, getting too close to people. The classic case of this is, how are you doing today? Fine. People say that when they're having a terrible day and week. What's going on there? Part of what's going on is like, I don't know if I just want to share, I don't know if I want to share at that level with you. So I want you to do something, uh, turn to your neighbor once again and ask them, how are you really doing today? And go ahead and answer.
All right. Now, when I looked around as you were doing that, I saw some of you just staying silent sitting by yourself, and that's okay, I still love you. Um, but I, I saw a lot of you smiling as you talk to each other. You see, we buy into this lie that maybe it's just better to not get deeper. And the truth is, uh, closer is actually better. And if you want to get close, you have to get real. You can't grow in a relationship or a friendship without being real, without going a little deeper in honesty and sharing what's really going on in your life. And that will often be a little uncomfortable. And so my kind of, my rule of thumb is to share, to, to start practice sharing at an uncomfortable but not inappropriate level. <laughs> and I know there's a tension there, um, and we just kind of have to figure that out. So often I think this looks like sharing it a little deeper than you're comfortable, but let's not go all the way to inappropriate, right? If someone asks how you're doing, you don't have to tell them your deepest, darkest secret and go on a 20-minute rampage about how terrible things are. Um, but you can, you can say, honestly, I'm not doing very well. It's been a hard week. Right? Uncomfortable, but not inappropriate. Because if you want to get close, you have to get real. Number two, uh, we lie to avoid rejection. And I mean this in the sense of, um, well, let me just show you again. Uh, turn to your neighbor and ask them, how do I look today? I'm just kidding. All right, I won't make you do that. I won't make you do that. But what you just felt is what I'm getting at. <laughs> we lie to avoid rejection. We lie sometimes because if we tell them the truth, it's going to make them mad or hurt them, and we're scared of the relational consequences of that. Let me give you three reasons why this is so important to actually give people honest critique and feedback. All right, you ready for these three reasons? American Idol, X Factor, and America's Got Talent. Okay, those are my three reasons why this is so dangerous. If you've ever watched the auditions for these shows, people go on live TV and they think and believe that they are super talented in an area. And they are not. And what happened to that person is that no one loved them enough to tell them the truth. Here's the truth. Honesty can hurt in the short run, but it helps in the long run. Honesty hurts in the short run, but it helps in the long run. And I know that's hard in the moment, but you can actually be really helping someone when you lovingly tell them the truth. Now, I'm not saying be blunt and a jerk, okay? <laughs> we want to be, we want to speak the truth in love. Speak the truth in love. So Janelle and I were talking about this idea this week and, and, and talking about just why is it that we don't want to give that feedback? And she made the point, and I, I think she's right, at least for me, is that oftentimes what's going on, when, when someone asks us something, you know, and, and we don't want to tell them the truth because we think it'll hurt them, I think often what's going on is we're not as concerned about that person as we are that person's acceptance of us. That's really what we're worried about. Not so much them and their life and what will build them up. We're actually worried about whether they'll continue accepting us and like us or not. We should love people enough to want to build them up and challenge them, even if that actually hurts them in the short run. So something I've been working on, and I'm not perfect at, but to, is to give yes and critiques. Yes and critiques. All right, so the way this works is instead of just saying, yeah, you should not try out for American Idol, um, you could say something like this. You could say, I love how much you love music. The passion and enthusiasm are just pouring out of you. And I think if you get some vocal coaching, you could get really good. <laughs> or you could be really great someday. <laughs> right. Yes, and. All right. So you don't say yes, but. Right. Yes, but is a little harder, right? Oh, I love this. But you really need some help. No. Yes, and. Yes, and if you get some help, you could really, because it's true. And if you get some help, you could get really good at this. So that's helpful for me kind of softens the blow, but it's still telling them the truth. Yes, and critiques. 
Lie number three, we lie to avoid taking responsibility. We lie to avoid taking responsibility. All right, one more congregational participation. Uh, I want you to look at the person next to you and glare at them. Give them a mean, evil eye. Shake your head in disapproval like you can't believe that they would do that. Like, just communicate with your face. I am so disappointed in you. I can't believe you. Okay. Um, <laughs> now, I want you to... Um, I want you to explain to that person why you were just so rude to them. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, the tendency is like, yeah, that was weird. It was Luke's fault. Uh, that guy on stage told me to. Now you look at them and say, uh, you don't actually have to say this, but imagine you look at them and say, you know, I should not have listened to that mean pastor. I was rude to you just now, and I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, we're just having fun. We're just having fun. But that, the point is there's a big difference between making excuses and making apologies. And that's what I'm trying to get at. And that's just one symptom of this tendency to, to lie to avoid taking responsibility. You know, when someone asks you, hey, did you do that thing I asked you to do? Well, I would have, but this happened and that happened and that happened. We lie to avoid taking responsibility. We give excuses instead of giving apologies. Because according to Jesus, we should be people of our word. When we say we're going to do something, we should do it. And so if we don't, we shouldn't just say, well, here's why I didn't do it. We should stop and say, you know what? I told you I would do that, and I didn't, and I'm sorry. Just full confession this week as I was working uh, on this. Um, God brought some people to my mind that I was guilty of telling them that I would do something and I didn't do. Someone had, so I, I told someone, hey, if you ever need anything, you know, call me, let me know. They had left a message at the church for me saying, hey, I really need some help with this. I was like, okay, I need to get back to that person. I'll get back to that person next week. And then I got busy and I got pushed down my to-do list and Almost two months have gone by. And I was working on my message. I was like, yeah, we need to accept responsibility. We need to apologize when we mess up. We need to be people of our word. And God brought this person to my mind. I was like, oh, man. And so a new item got added to my to-do list, which was to call them and to apologize. And it was difficult for me to call them and not say, here's why I didn't follow through. I decided, you know, I'm not going to go there. And I just told them, you know, I said, if you ever need anything, you could call me. And you called me, and I did not get back to you. I am so sorry. I'm really sorry. And they said, what are you talking about? <laughs> I forgot what I called about. <laughs> but then we had this great conversation, and um, it was a lot good encouragement. We went, went deep, and it was good. We need people who don't just make apolo uh, excuses, but make apologies. So we're going to have a time of response in a moment. And during that time, I, I want to encourage you to look through this list. Why do we lie and how do we get beyond that? We lie to avoid vulnerability, getting too close. We lie to avoid rejection. And we lie to avoid taking responsibility. I want you to consider which of those is maybe the biggest deal for you that you, God really wants you to work on. And to just talk and pray to him about, God, wh what do you want me to do to move forward on this? Maybe there's someone, someone like me that you need to reach out to and apologize to. Right? Maybe you just need to start making a practice of sharing at a more deeper level, being willing to be a little more uncomfortable. But I want you to consider how God is calling you to change because people who honor Jesus should honor their word. Like people where there's a matchup between what we say and what we do. And how amazing would it be if this is what Christians were known for? You know, can you imagine, like, bosses who aren't Christians themselves being like, yeah, those Christians, like, they believe some weird things, but man, I love them as employees because I ask them to do something, and they do it. I ask Bill to blah, 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 and there's no doubt in my mind that when he says he'll do something, he'll do it. How do our families be different? 
If there were no doubts at all in your kid's mind that when you said you'll do something, they don't have that lingering doubt, you think, all right, mom said it, she'll do it. Dad said it, he'll do it. That's enough. Because they've act out, acted that way in the past. I want to become that kind of person. And Jesus is calling all of us to become those kind of people whose words and actions line up. And when we mess up, we ask for forgiveness because we're people with grace at the center. We won't always get this per- perfectly, but we should be the first ones to admit when we don't and to seek to make restoration. If you honor Jesus, honor your word. I'm going to invite our worship team to come up, and we're going to have this time of response now. I just want to encourage you again to look at these three reasons why we lie and to consider what God is calling you to change and work on. And Deanna will also be forward, and if you'd like prayer for something, we're here. That's why Deanna's up here. Um, So you can pray with her. I'm up here. You can pray with me. If you have questions about something I talked about, something didn't make sense, I'd love to talk to you about that as well. And most importantly, if you're just starting to figure out this whole God thing, or you've been away from church for a while, or you're attracted to Jesus, but you don't know actually if you are a Christian or if you're a follower of Jesus and you have questions about that, I'd love to talk with you and pray with you through that and what that means and looks like and the hope that is in Jesus. So this is your time to respond, however it's fitting for you to respond. So let me pray for us, and then we'll stand and respond together. Jesus, your words are so challenging to us. God, I pray you'd, we'd take your challenge seriously, and that from our very hearts you would help us want to become the kind of people whose words and actions always line up, are totally congruous. Now, when we say we'll do something, we do it, and we say we can't, it's because we really can't. Help us not only to want to become those kinds of people, but to actually become those kinds of people and to follow you. God, change our hearts and help us to follow you with our words and with our lives. In your name we pray. Amen.